Aloha. This tradition of the Pacific Lecture is titled Vau Kanaka, the Hawaiian Pre-Contact Ecological Footprint, presented by Dr. Sam Ohugan. This was recorded on January 30th, 2014. I don't need that. Well, I hope I don't get feedback. I should turn it off, yeah. Well, whatever. Aloha mai kako. Aloha. Aloha no. Um, wow. Uh, can we turn the lights down? Is that, is that possible? Mahalo ehanale. Oh, yeah, that's more like it. So I can't see what I'm reading now. Okay. At any rate, Aloha Kako, I'm Sam Ohugan, and today I'm presenting an overview of a project to reconstruct the geography of pre contact human ecological landscapes in the Hawaiian Islands. You know, when we work today um, in areas that are strongly dominated, by native ecosystems. It's like being hurled back in time. Uh, we stand at a spot surrounded by native plants and animals and can easily imagine the world of hundreds of years ago at the peak of Hawaiian civilization. Um, what would that world look like? And how would the ecological footprint of pre-contact Hawaii compare with our modern footprint today? Hawaiian biological diversity has seen losses and changes as a result of the presence of people and their biological introductions. So too has Hawaiian culture seen losses in language, knowledge, and sovereignty. Yet traditional knowledge provides some of our best sources directly describing the pre-contact world. Our efforts to understand the magnitude of changes to natural systems in Hawaii led us at about the turn of the last millennium to model the patterns of major ecosystems in Hawaii so that we have a fair idea of the pre-human ecological settings here. And you can see uh, via the color, by the colors on this uh, mountain where some of those ecosystems were, from the alpine at the tops of Mauna Loa and Mauna Kea to the subalpine purple, down to the montane dry forests, and on to the windward uh, wet uh, montane and lowland forest systems. And this contrasts with the sometimes startling and staggering losses of our natural heritage in today's world, the pink representing those places where those native systems no longer hold sway. Oahu offers one of the more dramatic examples of the impacts that our human presence has wrought on the original native ecosystems. With only the mountaintops retaining significant dominance by native vegetation these days. However, for every before and after scenario, there are the transitions between them. And one important milestone is the footprint of Hawaiian presence prior to the arrival of Cook in 1778. It's been well established that the rich ecological setting of the high islands of Hawaii enabled Hawaiians to become one of the pinnacles of Polynesian societies, excelling in voyaging, featherwork, fishing and fish ponds, household amenities, kapa fabrics, and crafts of all kinds, and generating an equally rich cultural system in the pre-contact society that developed within it. During the millennium of Hawaiian presence in the archipelago, changes to native ecosystems began with increasingly extensive and intensive agriculture in both wet and drier lowland settings. Coupled with the effects of occupation and daily living in the largely coastal regions, where perhaps close to one million Hawaiians lived and engaged in all activities of a thriving Polynesian culture prior to 1778. When we think on the activities of daily Hawaiian life, we can ask ourselves about the cumulative impacts of those activities multiplied by hundreds and thousands across a finite island landscape. How much wood was burned to cook food daily? How much land was worked to grow food? What areas provided ready access to ocean resources? What areas were the best for houses and all the material culture of pre-contact Hawaiian life? The island of Oahu is a good place to explain our methodology because of a rich set of sources of various kinds, um, available for biology, pre-contact history, and post-contact land use. Oahu, for example, 
offers moisture conditions ranging from very dry on the leeward south and west regions to very wet as in the summit crest of the Ko'olau mountain range. Moderately dry and mesic areas are distinguished here by colors. Elevation of the island exceeds 4,000 feet only in a small part of the Waianae range, but approach 3,000 feet along the remainder of both Ko'olau and Waianae summit crests. Because of the tall summits, high rainfall areas in both summit regions, but particularly in the eastern Ko'olau mountain range, fed numerous continual perennial streams, bringing both water and nutrients to the lowlands. Large coastal and lowland wetlands, shown in light blue, occurred at various locations, bringing plentiful water to otherwise dry areas and creating very rich estuarine breeding grounds for nearshore marine fish. When we say Hawaiian footprint, it's a shorthand for the geospatial areas that were chronically occupied, directly manipulated, and significantly changed from the pre-existing Hawaiian ecosystem types into traditional Hawaiian uses. House sites, agricultural fields, fish ponds, religious sites, major roads and trails, etc. The geog geographic context for such Hawaiian cultural features is comprised of the Ahupua'a traditional land divisions within their moku or districts. The six traditional moku of Oahu are Ko'olau Poko, Kona, Eva, Waianae, Waialua, and Ko'olau Loa. Although the knowledge of the people of old was held in oral tradition, fragments were gathered and promulgated in Hawaiian language texts in the 1800s by a number of Hawaiian scholars and also by a large number of contributors to the Hawaiian language newspapers. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> a number of more recent scholars have helped amass and summarize such knowledge. Still others began the work of expressing this information in GIS, Geographic Information Systems using geospatial modeling and various sources describing the agricultural areas, the fish ponds, the temple sites, trails, storied locations, places of residence, and other traditional areas of frequent use, defining the areas of ecosystem displacement and direct change on the island of Oahu. Recently, some colleagues and I published on a geospatial model that depicts areas of high potential for wet and dry agriculture in Hawaii. Shortly thereafter, in the book Roots of Conflict, we elaborated further on the details of the model and the population and political ramifications that emerge when essential agricultural lands lend human assets to empower the great Hawaiian chiefdoms. Our work examined the requirements of the two major staple crops of Hawaii, kalo, taro, and uala, sweet potato, and extracted from the full habitat range of the Hawaiian landscape the combinations of topographic, climatic, and soil conditions that provided for the highest potential of those two crops. For kalo, the optimum com combination is plentiful water, low elevation warm settings, and gentle slopes. For Uala, the critical condition is winter rainfall sufficient to support growth of the vines, but not so heavy as to leach nutrients from the soil. Older soils typically had insufficient nutrients, so younger substrate er age was another factor. When we tested the model against actual archaeological complexes that related to the two crops, we saw remarkable con congruence, indicating that Hawaiians had developed many, if not all, areas of highest agricultural potential for Kalo and Uala. So the <coughs> excuse me, the blue are the um, Kalo systems, the red are the um, Uala systems as modeled, and the light blue lines are the archaeology of the agricultural fields for those areas. So you can see the good match that's there. When we apply the agricultural model on Oahu, we can see that the largest part of this uh, part of the footprint, shown here in Kalo purple and Uala red, occupied the areas near the coast, extending into valleys where sufficient freshwater flow created ideal conditions for the flood terrace cultivation of Kalo, for example. Although many of the Oahu streams flowed year-long, the combination of high flow, continuous streams, large flat-bottom floodplains, meant that perhaps 25 of them among them, Manoa, Nu'uanu, and Kalihi in the Kona district, 
Waianai and Makaha in the Waianai district, Anahulu and Malamanui in the Waialua district, Kaluanui, Punalu'u and Kahana in the Ko'olaoloa district, and Waikane, Waiahole and Maunawili in Ko'olaupoko district were optimal for Kalo agriculture. All of these places are celebrated in traditional sources as prosperous lands. Complementing this were the somewhat drier areas shown in red receiving sufficient rainfall to support uwala and other drier agriculture. In the windward district of Ko'olaupoko, the higher rainfall setting meant that the agricultural footprint there occupied the lowland mesic areas and extended a bit into the lowland wet zone at the foot of the Paliko'olau, the windward cliff systems. Adding to the agricultural hotspots, presenting the vital ai or vegetable food sources, are the equally important lokoi'a, fish pond, shown in bright blue here. These were major sources of i'a, protein food, and were clustered around the major estuaries at Pu'uloa, Waikiki, Maunalua, Kailua, Kaneohe, and Waialua, and were population and governance centers supported by their incredible fish resources. The major overland trail, shown in black here, connected the moku and also provided access to more upland sites, such as the chiefly complex of Lihu'e that straddled the boundaries of Eva, Waialua, and Waianai, and included the sacred birthplace of the Oahu chiefs at Ku Kaneloko. Lihu'e was a noted governance center of, of Oahu between A.D. 1400 and 1500. The chiefs of this area were called the Lo and lived in the uplands of Waialua, it's well known that the major trail systems connect the most important population and governance centers, which were also centers of food production on Oahu. Kukani Loko in Lihu'e was just one of the many heiau and other major religious sites, shown as bright yellow dots here. While the majority of these are in proximity to governance and production areas on or near the major trails, others were placed farther away from areas of major habitation. For example, near the headwaters of important streams or springs, or on the coast at important fisheries. Many other cultural sites have been documented over the years, and their distribution indicates a few more areas that were occupied. One particular dense cluster of sites in Lua Lua Le corresponds to the junction of Kole Kole Pass Trail and the inland trail system between Lua Lua Le, Waianai, and Makaha and points out a likely inland agricultural area that was not predicted by our dryland agricultural model. This is because our model was not set up initially to assess spring-fed fields, such as those near the base of the headwaters of Lua Lua Le Valley. Once we gathered up all these resource and access features, we proposed that the majority of the population of Oahu would live within a reasonable buffer distance of them, and then we unified all of the features to form a working footprint for the Hawaiian population of pre-contact Oahu. One other factor to consider, however, Oahu is a place of amazing diversity of topography. From virtually flat in parts of Eva and Kona to near vertical along the Pali of the Ko'olau districts. The topography models for Oahu allowed us to exclude areas too steep for comfortable habitation. If you take the areas too steep for walking or working easily and use them as an exclusionary mask, shown here in black, you can mask out portions of the footprint so people are not living on cliffs or steep slopes. As it turns out, the trimmed footprint is not hugely different. Okay, here's before. Oh wait. As it turns out, the trimmed footprint, here's before, and then here's after you trim it out. Did you see the difference? Well, at this scale, it's hard to tell. But at, at smaller scales, for example, at the level of the Ahupua'a, it becomes very important. So now we turn to the ecosystem details of the Hawaiian footprint. What percentage of the major ecosystem types were affected? Returning to the pre-human setting, uh, we see five major systems that were affected. The very dry lowland, dry shrubland and grassland. The moderately dry lowland, dry forest and shrubland the moist lowland mesic forest and shrubland, and the lowland wet forest and shrublands, in addition to uh, coastal and lowland wetlands. 
What does geospatial analysis of the footprint indicate relative to the native ecosystems previously occupying those areas? How much, in other words, of each ecosystem was covered by the footprint? The analysis of this footprint indicates that the largest impacts were in the wetlands that were converted into lo'ikalo and lokoi'a, fish ponds and, and terrace agriculture, with over half of the wetlands converted. A significant footprint was also seen in the lowland dry forests and shrubland areas, and the even drier lowland dry shrubland and grassland areas, where wood was collected for houses, cooking fires, tools, and other needs, land was cleared for habitation, and regular fires were set to promote peely grass fields for thatching. Less than 10% of the available lowland mesic forests and shrubland areas um, were affected, and these largely for kalo cultivation on the wetter ko'olau side. The footprint on the lowland wet forest areas and the cliffy areas, both wet and dry, were negligible. All told, just over 14% of the native landscape of Oahu was displaced by the Hawaiian footprint. Although the lowlands were in places completely transformed, the forest and shrublands of the uplands of Oahu seemed to have been largely unmodified. In the ancient Hawaiian universe, the world was divided into a dichotomy the realm of people, the Waukanaka, occupy the lowlands where that which grows is the result of human effort. Above this comfortable lowland zone was the Wawakua, the realm of the gods, where human effort had nothing to do with the verdant growth of native forest and where conditions were often wild and elemental. It was a realm occupied by Akua and Kupua, where Hi'iaka, the sister of Pele, encountered violent weather and powerful mo'o, where Kamapua'a, the pig demigod, would disappear into the fern thickets. It was a place to be avoided, the hideaway of cannibal chiefs such as Aikanaka, and a place where it was too wet for kappa to be worn. It had to be replaced with leaves if you were in those areas. There's a wonderful chant that describes traveling from Kailua over the Pali and down uh, Nu'uanu Valley um, until you reach uh, the opposite shore. And it talks about how when you get to the top of the pali, or um, yes, when you get to the top of the pali, you have to take your malo off, put it into your, into your uh, umeke on your carrying pole, pull out the tea leaf pa'u or skirt that you had prepared for the, for the trip, put that on, and then walk down the length of rainy, windy Nu'uanu Valley until you got to Kawananakoa, where you could, where you could uh, do the reverse, where you could take your tea leaf off and put your, put your malo back on. So does this mean that the areas outside of the footprint were entirely unaffected? Uh, it's become very clear that introduction of rats played a significant role in changes in, e in vegetation. The lolu palm forests of the Ko'olau districts were impacted greatly, and pollen records indicate that other major shifts in vegetation dominance occurred as well. On the other hand, the number of introduced species during the course of pre-contact history was small, some 50 or 60 plant species, the vast majority of which were not invasive, indeed could not persist in the environment well without human care. Kukui was perhaps the only major exception, able to spread through riparian areas and establish a distinctive and recognizable whitish-green canopy that persists today. But by and large, any temporary disturbance, even a complete removal of vegetation by fire or intensive agriculture, would have been recovered by native species, reasserting the native ecosystem matrix if left alone for long enough. After three years of working in partnership with the research department of the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, we extended the footprint analysis to all of the islands of the archipelago. On each island, the patterns and percentages held always a footprint below 15% of the total land area with, with island-specific patterns. For example, here's Maui. And so you can see, uh, for example, um, Nawai Eha, the four famous waters of eastern and west Maui. You can see the famous Kula sweet potato fields um, and the trails that ran through them. Uh, you can see Kaupo, which was another famous sweet potato area. Um, and of course, Ke Anai and the windward side of, of the Ko'olau, uh, Ko'olau and Hamakua districts there. Moloka'i, 
uh, where Kalau Papa was an amazingly uh, rich sweet potato growing area, where the valleys of Wailau and Pelekunu and others along the north coast, extending all the way to Halava, were, were, the, were the Kalo baskets of that island. Um, but not to be uh, ignored were the rich agricultural fields at the bases of, the, of places such as Kamalo, which l- had water year long in those days. Lanai and Kaho'olawe, uh, both relatively sparsely occupied, and yet you know, over 10% because of the seasonal fishing and other seasonal um, resources of those areas. Kauai and Ni'ihau. Um, Kauai was an amazing uh, place in the inlands of the eastern uh, areas and all of the northern, northern valleys. And Hawaii Island. The pattern of wet valley occupation and working of large seasonal fields applies across the archipelago. The total area of the footprint suggests a population in excess of 500,000 people based on patterns of gender and area of the agricultural footprint. It's not so much how many mouths can the footprint area feed, but rather how many people does it take to work that amount of area. As might be expected, the majority of the population was on the large island of Hawaii. It's remarkable to look on these maps in terms of the human geography of ancient Hawaii. And when used as a backdrop for the telling of traditional stories and accounts, every single prominent place name, every celebrated place um, in those stories is, is, uh, is covered by this footprint. Even though there are eight islands in the main Hawaiian archipelago, traditionally the islands are described as Namoku Eha, the four islands. And the four are Hawaii, Maui, Oahu, and Kauai. The Hawaiian Footprint Project made it very clear why. It identified those four islands as the ones that together comprise over 90% of the footprint and therefore 90% of the population of pre-contact Hawaii. It's rather interesting to me, when you look at it, that Oahu, although somewhat smaller than Maui, had a population and a, and a usable area uh, uh, and a footprint size larger than Maui. Um, that's largely because of the, the large area of alpine and subalpine, very difficult to, to occupy and, and uh, do agriculture on, and also Oahu's amazing water, uh, water resources. I mean, already... You know, we have 85% of the state's population on this island, and it's only because our water resources are so huge. So that was recognized in ancient times as well. Another thing that I found fascinating is if you look into the traditional accounts, you never see Molokai trying to take on Maui. You never see any of those kinds of interactions. You see the chiefs of, the, of Namoku Eha vying for dominance. Um, but you do see... Molokai and Lanai pitting themselves against each other. And when you look at the footprint, you can see that they're roughly equally, they were on roughly equal footing. That's what makes sense, that if you're going to take on somebody, you want to take on somebody roughly your size. <laughs> Looking at the footprint of Oahu again, one might, one might think that things aren't all that different from the situation today. After all, many of the pre-contact population centers are important to us today. Where we sit right now, for example, was occupied in pre-contact times. But when we actually overlay today's situation of the extent of destroyed native ecosystems, we see that the history of the last 230 years since contact have been far less kind to native ecosystems than the Hawaiian Hawaiian stewardship had been over the course of the millennium beforehand. The same pattern holds basically true for all of the other islands to greater or lesser extent. 11% of the traditional footprint to 70% lost on Maui. 8.4% on Molokai to 10 times that area on Molokai today. Lanai and Kaho'olawe both from 14% to about 80%. And Kauai getting going from 11% to over 70%. The acceleration of native ecosystem loss since Western contact has been dramatic, with the smaller, drier islands such as Ni'ihau losing essentially everything. Hawaii Island, by virtue of relatively vast 
and remote interiors, too high and too cold for cultivation, retains the highest percentage in modern times. The only island with less than a 50% footprint today. Ultimately, our goal is to provide a geospatial history of land use and change across the Hawaiian archipelago, building on the milestone of pre-contact Hawaiian footprint and eventually including the era of widespread sugarcane and pineapple monocrop agriculture, the introduction and spread of non-native ungulates such as cattle, goats, and sheep, and their wholesale denudation of the lowlands that created the watershed crisis at the turn of the last century and triggered the establishment of the forest reserve system here just over a century ago in, in 1903. Upon those huge changes come all of the other major historical contributors over the decades, leading to the current patterns of ecosystem loss and remaining biological diversity. It's a story that needs telling. Most people have no inkling of what our islands looked like in the past. They presume that it is much as it has been in their childhoods or those of their parents or grandparents. Understanding the finer details of the history of Hawaiian ecosystem change can provide us with insights on the maintenance and restoration of what remains and provide compelling messages about the consequences of our actions on our limited and extremely significant Hawaiian natural landscape. So mahalo, and here's a partial list of the sources and partners that have helped bring this project to its current state. Uh, Office of Hawaiian Affairs, State Historic Preservation Division, the archives, Eric Komori, who um, almost single-handedly resurrected um, the GIS uh, system that State Historic Preservation Division um, had amassed, but then had lost their, their GIS folks. Um, those folks that, uh, that made fast the stories of the ancient times from David Malo and Samuel Kamakao, John Papai'i, and all of the other classic sources um, onto those of modern times that continue in the same vein. Um, and lastly, one cannot uh, underscore, uh, uh, underestimate the, the uh, huge resource that Ulukau and the Ho'olaupa'i um, uh, Hawaiian language newspaper transcriptions and, and digitizations are bringing into the world today. There's going to be millions of pages of Hawaiian language uh, information dealing with uh, the past that will come to bear in the years to come. So thank you very much. So somebody turn the lights off for, uh, there we go, and turn them back on for me. Now. Um, are, there any, are there any questions after, after all of that? Um, that one is in the Mele of Kuali'i, and you can find that in Foranander, um, Volume 6. It's a long chance. You might have to hunt for that section. Well, um, when you look at Rapa Nui, it's a single island, roughly the size and elevation of Lanai, and so a lot more vulnerable to losses of that kind. Um, on, in our archipelago, we have you know, areas where rats still haven't gotten to, um, and uh, we also have a wide range of vegetation types, so that rats, even if they desired, say, 20% of those trees, there would still be 80% of the tree species in order to maintain the ecosystem matrix and the ecosystem function. Uh, when you have an island in which it was famous that the palms were the dominant, and then you have something that rats love to eat, they can, in a rel relatively short time, depending on how long the adult palms live, um, completely truncate the, the growth patterns of the dominant forest. And once you do that, then you can't even leave the island.
Um, there were several. There are several traditional sources on on Pua'a that that fascinate me. Um, one of them uh, was uh, talking about how the way to prepare a pua'a for sacrifice was, was to get your pua'a, lift it up over your head, and dash it to the ground. Okay, so that suggested to me that the Polynesian pig was a much smaller animal than the European porkers that can reach up to 400 pounds that are plowing around in the forest right now. The other thing that's really interesting is an insight that most people don't know. It's, um, it's earthworms. Okay. Um, pigs are omnivores like people, and so they need both plant and animal um, matter in order to, to live. And when pigs are rooting in the uplands today, they're largely doing so to get at protein sources. And the major protein source is earthworms. And the earthworms that you find in our native forest today are non-native earthworms. So in the times, in ancient Hawaiian times, Lacking those uh, protein sources in the uplands, your pigs might get loose, um, but in a very short time, they'd be coming around to the dinner table again, um, looking, for, looking for food uh, from their human uh, caretakers. Not only that, but if your pig got loose from you and got into your neighbor's patches, you know, your uala, their uala patch or their kalo patch, you would be personally in trouble, right? And your pigs are really important protein sources of their own right, and so it would make sense to take good care and keep track of, of, of your source. So the whole idea of pigs being you know, let loose into the forest and then hunted as needed, that's probably not how it was done. Yeah, that's the, uh, it's the same phenomenon as, as Rapa Nui, right? When you have the smaller islands that, uh, um, that have a smaller area to start with and then fewer ecosystems and therefore fewer numbers of different kinds of species, um, they're likely to collapse much sooner than, than, a, richer, than a richer system would. Uh, Lanai, though, you have to, you have to think on, on the history of that island. And there was indeed um, widespread change, largely as a result of sheep and, and cattle. Um, during Rock's time, Rock was, Joseph Rock was an early botanist here. Um, even in his time, and that would have been you know, 1900 or so, um, he was describing dry forests on Lanai nearly down to the coast on the west side. And you know, you're not going to find anything except Garden of the Gods, you know, boulder fields and eroding and eroding uh, landscapes there, or Kiave and non-native grasses from, from Africa. I remember seeing a map of Kiave uh, on the island of Kaho'olawe, and they showed how in the late 1800s there were plantings along the, sorry, along the north coast. By 1920, they occupied 25% or so of the island. And by 1960, they were essentially covering the area that they do now, which is pretty much everywhere uh, on that island. And so you can have a, a really amazing, um, complete change of a small island's ecosystem by one or two dominant uh, species if you give them a chance. That's why that point I made about how only 50 or 60 species of plants, the majority of which could not grow without human help, that was a really important uh, feature of, of ecosystem dynamics in, in pre-contact times. If we tried to do that now, leave a place fallow, and hope for the best, hope for native uh, species to come back, you'll just get the fastest growing weeds from South America, Africa, Southeast Asia, and all of the, among the 20,000 plus species of plants that we've introduced to the Hawaiian Islands, um, only 10% of which might be able to naturalize, that is, reproduce outside of human care, and only 10% of which might be noxious, uh, noxious enough to become invasive species, you still got 100 um, plants from all over the world that can do a number if you, just, if you leave them alone. 
So today's uh, conservation challenges in Hawaii are all about finding the tools to deal with entrenched pests, um, as well as um, immediately detect and eliminate anything that's not supposed to be on the island, say koki or, or other things. Myconia, whenever Myconia shows up on Oahu, they're right on it and they will uh, be you know, doing that. And otherwise we'd be in the same uh, boat that Hawaii Island is on, right? The whole windward Hilo district, there's a lot of Myconia and people are kind of despairing about whether or not they'll ever be able to get rid of it. Um, in those cases, maybe biological control might be the only option. Um, and when you think about biological control, it isn't so much a matter of making things worse by bringing in something else that's new. I think of it more in terms of, you know how when you're in a native forest, you have thousands of species, each of which is a kino of one of the Hawaiian akua, and each of which have their relationship with each other. Um, and like a community of, of people, um, they do their thing together. Um, when you remove that whole community and you just have one, one individual acting alone without any kind of interactions, then you might have trouble. Um, but if you have that, that uh, individual in the middle of the community of, of species that keep it in check, then, then you stand a better chance of having a balanced, a balanced system. So uh, it's Darcy Oishi, uh, first Native Hawaiian in charge of a biological control branch of the State Department of Agriculture, so all power to him, um, who speaks of reestablishing the Kino, the Kino relationships between, between non-native species and their relationships that they once had when they, were, when they were elsewhere and that they need to have again in order to uh, be in balance. So we have to kind of rethink the whole history of biological control, the majority of which actually wasn't biological control. It was just some individual deciding that something was good and throwing it onto the islands. That's a completely different uh, um, process than the very careful, sometimes decade-long process that it takes to test carefully and then bring in something that you think might be useful. With birds. Um, the ecological footprint of Hawaiians and birds is the question. Um, and when you think about it, wetlands, um, lo'ikalo, are essentially wetlands. And so when you turn a, a bottom of a valley into a system of terraced wetlands, um, it stands to reason that you might even increase the amount of, of native water birds um, that could be found in, the, in a place like that. And so the other thing to think about is that Hawaiian agricultural systems were never completely domesticated systems. They were semi-wild systems. They relied on the ecological processes still being intact that took water from the mountains and, and, and sent them down to the sea. And in fact, they made sure to um, divert water into the systems and then return the water to the to those stream systems uh, so that they could continue on their way. Um, that's another, that's another difference, right? We tend to compartmentalize our modern agriculture and do nothing but that thing and without any real attention to how the role that piece of land plays in the, in the larger ecosystem function. Would you care to comment on the future of sustainable agriculture? Um, would I care to comment on the future of sustainable agriculture? I, I think that it's absolutely essential for us. Um, one of these days, um, it's going to be too expensive for planes to fly here or for ships to, to be here. And when that day comes, we better be able to grow everything that we needed. Um, we have evidence now that roughly a million people lived here. We have a roughly million people now. There, we'd have to redistribute ourselves with the majority of us going to the island of Hawaii, uh, etc. Namoku eha, that's my tip to you. Uh, go to those four islands. Uh, because you might be able to, to, to make a go of it. But the cool thing is that almost all the places that were famous for the re, uh, reinvigoration of traditional Hawaiian agriculture were also some of the heartlands in this agricultural model. And so you could use this model. Anyone who's interested in reestablishing a sustainable lifestyle in the, these islands could use this work here and, and as guidance for where to 
where to put their efforts forward. Um, I think that uh, I think that it makes sense that kukui, which is easy to transport and grow, um, it makes sense that you would that you could grow kukui anywhere that you wanted to. Um, on the other hand, uh, you should never under, as, underestimate the good bounce. You know, if you've got a steep gulch going down and a kukui tree at the at the top of its distribution and the nuts are falling down and they hit the boulders, they're going to bounce downhill maybe most of the time. But occasionally, they're going to bounce uphill. And that's going to take, and without any other kukui uh, to, com to compete with it, it's going to grow. And so you're going to have this creep of kukui going up, up the valleys, even if people aren't taking them up the valleys. But those hanging valleys are the, you know, way above, um, probably a good argument that people are taking them there. What is the greatest threat to our sustainability today? Um, one is probably the unforesightful uh, truncation of agricultural lands. It, we've got to make sure that we have enough agricultural lands, viable agricultural lands, to support us. Um, uh, the other, though, is that problem of non-native species. Um, we no longer have the paradise of things. You try growing kalo and you'll have apple snails and you'll have various diseases that weren't, weren't around. You'll have all kinds of weeds that you didn't have to deal with. The same is true just about just about any endeavor in either restoration or traditional agriculture or, for that matter, uh, conventional agriculture in Hawaii is that we're such a paradise for anything coming from anywhere in the world that we probably need to really beef up our biosecurity and and uh, ensure that we don't close our own doors, right, to, to future use of the land. Um, you know, there was some use of sandalwood. Sandalwood was a fragrant uh, wood, and so that was used. But it wasn't until it became a commodity, until, it, until Western uh, economies entered into the picture, that wholesale logging of sandalwood. Um, occurred. And so um, that whole phenomenon is a post-contact phenomenon and one that, uh, that I think is pretty clear uh, came about as a result of imposition of, of uh, Western models onto, onto natural resources here. It was the first unsustainable use of a native product. There's some people who argue that there's no such thing, that you can't go anywhere, even if you went to a place that was 100% native now, um, that the composition of the species would be different as a result of, say, rats removing all of the palms and like, the lack of all of the native forest birds in the, in the lowlands. Um, nonetheless, nonetheless, uh, we do know that uh, in those places where the systems have been least disturbed, they also tend to be the richest. And so if you've got something like down to Lama and Koa and Ohi'a, say really strong dominant species, and occasionally you'll find little remnants of other obscure n uh, native trees, um, you can almost bet that in earlier times, before the, the disturbances, that that forest patch would have been uncharacterizable. You would stand in one place and there would be six different kinds of native trees above you, move 50 meters that way, and there would be six other kinds of native trees above you. Um, we call those diverse mesic forests. They tended to, to occur in the not too wet and not too dry um, areas. So take any native area, greatly enrich the number of tree and, and other plant species, and you'll probably get closer to, to what, the, what the original system looked like. Um, there are others in this audience who can speak to that kind of, that kind of idea, but uh, but the more I the more I've uh, seen, 
the more that, that pattern tends to hold. The first step is simplification of a native system into still a native system, but a much simpler native system. And then the weeds come in, and then you get 50-50 native, non-native, and, and then it's downhill from there. Well, you know, the, the whole idea of the Wawakua Waukanaka is one of the basic kapu, right? When you've got a realm that's occupied by the gods and people aren't supposed to be there, that's a result of kapu. I mean, that's a the, the idea that people cannot be there is a sacred religious restriction of behavior. And so that's, you only violate that um, under, with great need and with proper, with proper um, protocol. So that protocol would uh, require sacrifice of, on your part, um, and you would not do it uh, on a whim. So that kind of, that kind of thing, um, that was a 100% type of thing, right? That, that one, uh, that particular restriction. And then there were the seasonal restrictions, right? In which case, the konohiki, the individual or individuals, who grew up in that system were selected for their knowledge of the resources and, their, and the way those resources behave over the year, um, they would be the ones turned to to say, when does fishing of this fish species stop? When can we collect that particular fiber plant uh, up, in the, up in the lower forest zone? Um, all of those things were, were uh, taken as given, that you would have people who knew uh, when the appropriate time was uh, to to gather uh, items, and all of that would be imposed. I mean, when you look at the even the lunar calendar of today, right? The Ole nights, you're not supposed to be out fishing. Just think about that. If you've got roughly eight days out of every month in which people are not fishing, that's an amazing rest period for for marine resources. We have nothing like that now. I mean. Some people, because they're interested in reestablishing those, those relationships, will honor those kinds of things. But for your average person on the street, and certainly for commercial fishermen, you don't see anything of that, of that sort. And so we lack those kinds of, of both short-term and longer-term um, self-imposed societal restrictions on our, on our relationship with, with, uh, with the natural systems that support us. Yes, I think so. I think you would do it community by community. Um, you would choose, a, you would choose a, a particular uh, community in a place, say, Haena on Kauai, you know, where they've already started mapping out in detail all of the fishing areas and the names of them and who knows about them. Um, they've already started um, proposing a set of guidelines on when to fish and when not to fish and they're going to come forward to the Department of Land and Natural Resources in order to s establish a s community special management area. Uh, those are the kinds of steps that, that it would take. Um, it would require the communities around them to honor those, to honor those community-imposed restrictions. But in a, in a place like Kauai, in an area where the population is small enough and you can communicate those kinds of things, I think it has a chance. Oahu would be really hard to do. Oh my gosh. Um, but you got to start somewhere. You know, thank goodness that we have um, descriptions such as Kuali'i's chant. It's really interesting to see the description of the, of the landscape as you, as you take that uh, chant down. Um, there are all kinds of plants mentioned in that chant. Uh, so it's a wonderful thing to be able to just say, okay, you know, they mentioned makole and they mentioned, you know, all kinds of... Makole is a little um, understory herb that grows in the... Uh, now it grows in the most undisturbed uh, wet forest areas. And so the fact that they would describe something like that growing in an area like Nu'uanu... Um, just speaks volumes, right? Uh, if you've got makole there, then you can imagine all of the other associates of makole um, that, that grow in places that, where you find that plant now. Um, I've lost my track. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, 
But there were also the early ornithologists who were describing, you know, things like a kialoa and o'o and other uh, bird species right in the uanu. You know, and so you know that the four systems that were required for, for them to be uh, living were there in the 1800s. Um, ironically, it's uh, about that time when the numbers of cattle and goats just skyrocketed. And so it wasn't until uh, uh, 1880-something that James Campbell, for example, started his campaign to remove goats uh, and cows from Honoluliuli area. Uh, and reported hundreds of thousands of animals re removed every year for a number of years until it finally started to, to uh, go down. So you know that they were in there, in force, eating everything that they, that they could uh, find. So the thing that amazes me is that there was anything left. And that given half a chance, the fencing and the public-private uh, relationships that established themselves in 1903, that the native forest was able to make a comeback in those in some areas. In some areas, it was beyond that, and you had to bring in fast-growing trees from everywhere in the world: eucalyptus and ironwood, and all of the things that grow in our lowland in our lowland forest reserves now. But the fact that there that there is native forest uh, in the face of 200 years of uncontrolled uh, ungulates. Um, that speaks about the resilience of native species and, and how if you give them a chance, they could reestablish in even today's world. And so it heartens me a lot to see ko, to see other native um, tree species coming into um, urban uh, landscaping. I love that. Uh, so we need more of that. There are, there are, um, there are hardy native trees that can, can reassert themselves into our, into our surroundings. Global warming is a really amazing uh, phenomenon, and I want to show one map uh, that was uh, particularly uh, fascinating to me, and that was the map of Maui. And uh, there you go. So you see the Kula flank? Um, I don't know if you guys know where Kula is. Uh, but, and you can see the stippled area in pink. That's the seasonal sweet potato zone. And do you notice that in, it's currently in a dry setting? Um, if you tried to grow sweet potato in the lower edge of that, indeed anywhere in that today, you'd probably fail utterly. Um, and that's because the mesic zone that used to be the sweet spot for, for sweet potato has moved up the mountain. So in even you know, 300 years, we have a shift of the climatic zone up the mountain. Global warming um, models are predicting those kinds of shifts. The lowlands will get drier. The, um, the alpine zone will expand as the, as the um, inversion layer lowers. So the, the sweet, wet spot is going to get sandwiched between an expanding dry lowland and an expanding dry uh, alpine. And, and you'll, you know, if you wanted to grow it now, you'd have to go higher up the mountain. So um, those kinds of things were showing up. In fact, it got really wild in Kaupo, where you can see that it got, got down pretty close to sea level. They were able to grow. They were able to grow sweet potato in those areas. So we know that it was a lot moister um, there than it is now. Uh, the, the more people look at it, the more the patterns seem to be turning into a, into a, steady, into a steady drying trend. Um, so hang on to your hats. Yeah. Um, the, uh, that being said, we have high island systems. That's the saving grace for us, is that we do have things way up above where we are now and that we have room for things to move. Um, the, if you're talking about birds, for example, on the island of Maui, that wet flank, that dark green flank on the, on the windward side, that's where the majority of the endangered bird species remain. 
Um, and that flank is going to squeeze upward and downward, but it will remain. Um, we're doing a series of vulnerability assessments for every single native plant species, um, flowering plant species um, in Hawaii, as well as all of the native uh, forest birds. And for Maui, the forest birds have a future. Um, for Kauai, where they're already on a flat top plateau, when that, when that um, climate zone goes above and is hovering somewhere in the air, they will have nothing. So, uh, and it's not so much that the f there won't be forests there, it's just that there will be mosquitoes across the whole plateau and, and therefore disease. So now the disease folks are already turning to those folks that just made that breakthrough um, that um, makes human malaria untransmittable by mosquitoes via a modification of the mosquitoes. So I love that idea. You know, if they can modify our mosquitoes so that they can no longer carry avian malaria, that might be a useful thing for, for our birds. I don't think the counties have passed any uh, rules about uh, GMO mosquitoes yet. Yeah, you know, within human history, the question was regard to um, changes in ocean temperature and, and patterns that, that lead to, for example, l fewer trade wind days and more Kona, more Kona days. Um, and the, the neat thing is that in human history, there, we haven't seen those kinds of changes. But if you go back into the palynological history, say in bog cores and the like, um, uh, work by Vitusek and others, say, in Kohala, have shown that there have been times when it's been much colder and drier, when it's been much drier and warmer. And, and, uh, and so um, we know that the, our systems have gone through major changes. Uh, it's just that um, we and the systems that we value now, uh, in the face especially of the huge changes we've brought in from the outside, um, we no longer have the luxury of just waiting for the systems to, to um, settle themselves in. Uh, we're likely to, to run into systems that are completely non-native, and then once you get there, then what are, we, what are we in conservation for? Or at least if we're interested in, in the biological diversity of a place. So, and I, I hope that almost all of you are. Uh, any other questions? Um, the question was, were the trail systems uh, uh, um, an exception to kapu? Uh, yes, I, yes, I would have to say. Um, on the other hand, when you look at it, right, the Kula lands, those would be p considered part of the Waukanaka. They would be considered part of the realm of people. And so you wouldn't have that kind of, of kapu associated with. <coughs> Excuse me. There were probably seasonal restrictions on being up there. And so... Um, to that extent, yes, maybe there was a time when you're not supposed to use that trail. Even if you needed to get to you know, a location there, you'd probably jump into your canoe and, and, and paddle over there instead. So it's hard, to, it's hard to describe. A lot of the trail use in the, um, in the traditional sources describe the movement of chiefs. And chiefs themselves have a whole different set of restrictions that they need to that they need to pay attention to, that probably did or did not apply to to regular people, depending on on time of year and and need. Uh, 
Um, yes, because this is a joint project with the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, you can go on to their Kipuka database um, and just search for Hawaiian footprint, and you'll find all of these all of these maps. I don't know if you'll find the raw GIS files. If you want the raw GIS files, um, Kamoa Kitevis and their GIS staff and our own GIS staff at, at the Nature Conservancy can provide that for you. Um, we don't intend to restrict this, and in fact, um, they're still undergoing their review, and so if you're an expert on where native agriculture used to occur and you want to test any of these rigorously, by all means, grab them and let us know. We did send them out to experts on each island, and the uh, feedback that we got back was really heartening. Uh, one of the reviewers on Kauai was, was bubbling about how, oh, you even found my site up at, you know, that kind of, that kind of thing. And so I, I'm, I'm glad that uh, we were able to find his site. I mean, I knew that it would com probably be a completely down, thumbs down review if we hadn't found this secret site. <laughs> so you, you're asking about the green parrot? Yeah. And wh what was the question? How would they affect the ecosystem? Um, well, I can't speak to that parrot, but you know, parrots eat various things, and so the things that they eat, if they include native species, that might be a problem. We do know that Jackson's chameleon, for example, have been found with endangered tree snails in their stomachs um, as they move in their range up into those places where those endangered snails are found. So it's not a trivial thing, right? When you've got something that eats something and it might include native things, uh, you have to worry about whether or not they'll get into that zone where the native still holds sway. There are a number of prophetic chants. Um, and uh, as with all prophetic chants, they're open to, to uh, interpretation. And, uh, you know, the famous one, Eho ana o luna, e pii ana o lalo, e hui ana na moku, e ku ana kapaia. That one is the, the high will be brought down, the low will be brought up, the lands will be united, uh, and the, but the foundation will stand. Um, that was supposed to be, right, the end of the Ali'i system, the equivalence of, you know, the rising up of, of common people, um, the, the unification of all of the islands under a single rule, etc. Um, so, you know, one can go through those things and see um, what, what one can find. Uh, the, the whole beauty, though, of Hawaiian language is its, is its flexibility and me multiple meanings and the like. So one could, one could interpret so many different ways uh, with, with, uh, with the words that one has. Oh uh, yes, this, uh, this was completed just this past year. Oahu was three years ago. Uh, we followed that with all of the Maui Nui uh, groups as a joint venture with uh, Office of Hawaiian Affairs. Uh, we took the lead on that one, and they learned how to do the how to do the process of gathering the the sources and models and and creating the the uh, footprint. And then the, in the third year, Kawaii Niihau and Hawaii were completed with o Oha in the lead, and with the Nature Conservancy just there to take a look every month at what at what progress was being made. So it's a, neat, uh, it's a neat thing. And so now Office of Hawaiian Affairs has the, has the complete method and can, uh, can take the results and adjust them as feedback is gathered. Mm -hmm. Ko'olauloa is an amazing place for, for, um, potential, for potential reestablishment of sustainable agriculture. 
Oh, certainly. There have been inquiries by, by various planning agencies for, for this information. I presented this uh, similar, a similar presentation to the Commission on Water Resource Management um, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, it was well received and, and a lot of very insightful questions were asked, so I'm, I'm glad that they're interested. They invited me to, to present on this. Uh, um, that in the, that's an experiment. Um, it's a predator-proof fence that allows the shear waters and the albatrosses to nest there unmolested by mongoose and cats and dogs and even rats and mice. That's a complete mammal exclusion fence and it's based on Aotearoa um, methods. Uh, and just looking at the way that fence is holding up, I don't expect it to be the final solution, but they needed to demonstrate that given protection, those seabirds could reestablish, and I think they've demonstrated that uh, amply. Um, it's a very expensive uh, system to try to, to try to establish, especially at larger scale. So, uh, but, but, the, but it has been demonstrated that if you do it, you will get results, and so that's, that's very heartening to me. Well, excess deer are really difficult animals to keep out of anything. Uh, you need a really tall fence, and then you need, uh, uh, you need constant vis vigilance. And it's very difficult to even establish whether or not you've completely removed all the animals from an enclosure of that sort once you, once you have. It's like the axis deer that were illegally taken to the island of Hawaii, and they still don't know whether or not they've gotten them all because it's such a huge area, small number of deer. You can get you know, 90% of your animals, but all it takes is that last 10% to make it all worthless, the effort. Until you take them to zero, you have to take them to zero. So, uh, so the problem uh, holds on Lanai. You can take a small enclosed area to zero, but the moment a tree comes down over that fence or um, the uh, sea winds corrode a portion of the fence, then, you know, the animals are likely to be back in there again, and you have to begin that process all over. Uh, so it's a it's a difficult it's a difficult situation. Um, the Aotearoa one of some of the Aotearoa examples um, demonstrate that the best results are when you completely remove all of a pest from an island, so that you're not trying to you know keep a small portion of the island free of the pest. You just get rid of the pest all island wide. Um, Kaho Olave is the only one of the eight main islands that has no ungulates, no goats, no cows, no sheep, um, nothing. Um, no vegetation largely though. But <laughs> actually that's not true, you know, there's a lot of pili grassland and kama'o and various other things and the plantings that are there, um, unmolested by animals, are doing some pretty amazing things. And so it's an uh, it's amazing demonstration of what can happen when you do that approach, when you go in and you remove all of the browsing animals from an island and then try your replanting. Because then now you don't have to put any fences at all. The whole island is, is ungulate free. So I think that that's, at least we have that experiment going. Well, I told you, right after this, you want to take it through the story of landscape change, right? Um, the Department of Agriculture has maps of every single pineapple field and sugarcane field that was ever put into production. Um, and I, you know, we need to go in there, digitize all of that, and get that up so that we can see what, what that meant for um, the further changes of, of, of ecosystems um, in, in these islands. Um, 
right? I mean, all of the places where we live in Mililani and places like that used to be sugarcane fields beforehand. So they were kind of pre-cleared and ready for, ready for infrastructure when that happened. I mean, you can't judge it in retrospect. I suppose you could judge anything in retrospect, but um, knowing it is the important thing, right? Knowing that story and being able to tell it so that people don't presume, oh yeah, this place always looked like this. Because it's not, it didn't. That's a good question. Notice on Oahu, I had, we had the luxury of the, of the extensions of the Ahupua'a out into the marine resources. And if you overlay these lines with the reef lines, you know, where the reef go into the deep and you get the Malolo zone and the traditional boundaries of the Ahupua'a, most of those match really well. It's a remarkable thing. And so we know that there was that relationship um, uh, uh, at an ecological level for the people who lived in an Ahupua'a that extended out to that dotted line uh, offshore. Uh, we, don't have, we don't have a good handling of that. So that's something that I invite any of you marine folks to uh, come and do for us, because it needs doing. What I'd like to do is, um, this is, say, 1770. And so I want 1870, 1970. That's what I want to do. I want those steps along the, along the way. We'll give it in 100 year, 100 year increments and see what's going on there. The context for 1870, for example, will be right in the middle of that whole kingdom, kingdom land use thing. There was, a, there was a question in the back. Practical action that people can take? Um, good question. Uh, I think it is a matter of being aware of, uh, being aware of our important agricultural lands, uh, being aware of changes proposed for land use. I mean, a lot of the folks here are already aware of those things, at least within their own regional levels. Um, and if you were going to do anything, that, that would be the place that you would start, right, is in your own, in your own communities. Um, so, uh, and it is a matter of figuring out what is the process that, that uh, occurs as you go from a proposal somewhere to actually things happening on the ground uh, and knowing where to insert yourself, where to provide the feedback, where to point out um, the impacts that might, that might occur, um, where to get a hold of information of this sort and, and wield it or to share it with folks that, that would be in a position to, to make use of it. Um, that's, that's one of the things to do. Uh, I grew a heck of a lot of native plants in my yard, you know, and so I'm trying to reestablish uh, um, the native canopy within the urban, suburban um, setting. And I th one of the things that really irks me nowadays is when you go, say, driving through, I won't name any communities, but you'll see you know, seven trucks and cars, they're all parked on cement, and it's the cement that goes from the house to the sidewalk. And they've completely removed any living things uh, from their yard and paved it entirely over so that they can not get mud on the, on the tires or something. Uh, and I have a feeling we need to have, like, some county... Uh, ordinance that charges you if you do that and gives you an incentive if you don't do that. You know, that, that uh, if, you grow, if you're growing trees and have lawn or edible plants in your yard, that you get a benefit from it some, somehow. I, I would love to see that because I hate seeing those paved over properties. How much impact, though, would it make if, let's say, we 
I think if everybody did it, it would make a huge impact. I mean, all it takes is a corridor, right? I mean, Amakihi come to my ohi a tree in my yard. So if they do that in my yard and everybody had um, ohi a trees all the way down to sea level, um, then all of the Amakihi that are resistant to <laughs> malaria now could sip their way to sea level. So... I think it's a story that's worth telling. Um, it, it did get an a article in the um, Hanaho magazine, right, if you remember, uh, a couple months back. Uh, so I had my 15 minutes of fame on Hawaiian Airlines. Uh, but I think that the story of landscape change in Hawaii, yes, that would be a worthwhile story for somebody to turn into a documentary and, and tell that story. And, and, and it w you could find all kinds of really cool archival footage to, to put in there. Uh, this is going to be podcast. Yeah. And I was supposed to be repeating every single question and I failed to do so. Oh, I think that preparation for natural disasters is a real important thing. I mean, all we need to look at is Hurricane Iniki and the island of Kauai, right, um, in 1991. So that, I mean, some people argue that parts of Kauai never recovered from that, that uh, the trajectory of that island is completely different than it would have been if that, if that hurricane had not um, occurred, uh, both in the positive and the negative, I suppose. Um, so yes, anticipating what the what what likely um, uh, what likely disasters would be, and they would largely be storm related. That's a good one. Tsunami. I mean, we kind of we kind of dodged the bullet when you look at the maps of the tsunami wave height. Uh, for some reason, I mean, maybe a lot of good pule on the part of uh, people, uh, but for some reason, um, Hawaii got hit a lot less hard than it could have. Uh, when when the big when the big uh, Japan tsunami came through, uh, so those two um, biggies for sure. But I I think uh, that biological uh, invasion disasters, you know, for example, if biting flies got to Hawaii and if suddenly every single beach in Hawaii was uninhabitable because you be eaten alive by something, that would be nasty for our economy. And yet we don't really think about preventing those kinds of things. Uh, or at least not hard enough, I think. Okay. Oh, five most important plants? Um, definitely a tree with edible fruit. That's always a good thing. I would definitely put in uh, native plants that you find beautiful and, and um, of value, uh, both for the cultural value and just for the fact that they tend to be gorgeous things anyway. Um, so I said edible, uh, uh, fruit, um, a lay, lay plants of various kind. Uh, I would put those in. What, do I, what else do I have in my yard? Um, plants that you just enjoy seeing. I mean, for example, I like I like orchids, and so I put I have orchids underneath in the shade of all of the native trees. Um, so, but I do tend to things I can eat and native things. Those are the things that I tend to put in. Thank you very much. Mahalo for listening. 
If you have any questions or comments on this or other online audio programs, please visit us online at www.bishopmuseum.org. If you like us on Facebook, you'll be alerted when new programs are available. Ahui Ho from the Bishop Museum.